morning, boys and girls. Thank you for all joining me today for chapter four of Matilda. I hope you all are having a great time this week enjoying our spirit week. Today is hug and kiss your pet day. And for those of you guys who didn't tune in my first week, this is Watson. His full name is Sir Pugsley Watson of Federal Hill O'Brien. And he is 13 years old. Actually, he's almost 13. He's gonna be 13 in just a couple days. And he's been with me for a long, long time. I got him right after I graduated college when I lived in Baltimore. So he is like one of my most, most beloved little, little guys. And I just love him to death. He's been really sick lately. So I've been giving him some extra love. So don't forget to hug and kiss your pets today. Okay, chapter four of Matilda is called The Ghost. There was a comparative calm in the Wormwood household for about a week after the superglue episode. The experience had clearly chastened Mr. Wormwood and he seemed temporarily to have lost his taste for boating and bullying. Then suddenly, he struck again. Perhaps he had had a bad day at the garage and not sold enough crummy secondhand cars. There are many things that make a man irritable when he arrives home from work in the evening and a sensible wife will usually notice the storm signals and will leave him alone until he simmers down. When Mr. Wormwood arrived back from the garage that evening, his face was a dark as a thundercloud and somebody was, somebody was clearly for the high jump pretty soon. What are you looking for, Mr. O'Brien? My glasses. You wanna say hi to the kids? Boys sure. and girls, you wanna meet Mr. O'Brien? This is Mr. O'Brien. Hi. Hope you're having a good time, even though you're not at school. Okay. I don't know where your glasses are. I think they might be on your desk or on the chair. Okay. His wife recognized the signs immediately and made herself scarce. Then he strode into the living room. Matilda happened to be curled up in an armchair in the corner, totally absorbed in the book. Mr. Wormwood switched on the television. The screen lit up. The program blared. Mr. Wormwood glared at Matilda. She hadn't moved. She had somehow trained herself by now to block her ears to the ghastly sound of the dreaded box. She kept right on reading, and for some reason this infuriated her father. Perhaps his anger was intensified because he saw her getting pleasure from something that was beyond his reach. Don't you ever stop reading, he snapped at her. Oh, hello, Daddy, she said pleasantly. Did you have a good day? What is this trash, she said, snatching the book from her hands. It isn't trash, Daddy. It's lovely. It's called The Red Pony. It's by John Steinbeck, an American writer. Why don't you try it? You'll love it. Filth, Mr. Wormwood said. If it's by an American, it's certain to be filth. That's all they write about. No, Daddy, it's beautiful. Honestly, it is. It's about... I don't want to know what it's about, Mr. Wormwood barked. I'm fed up with your reading anyway. Go and find yourself something useful to do. With frightening sadness, he now began ripping the pages out of the book in handfuls and throwing them in the waste paper basket. Matilda froze in horror. The father kept going. There seemed little doubt that the man felt some kind of jealousy. How dare she, he seemed to be saying with each rip of the page. How dare she enjoy reading books when he couldn't? How dare she? That's a library book, Matilda cried. It doesn't belong to me. I have to return it to Mrs. Phelps. Then you'll have to buy another one, won't you, said father, tearing out the pages. You'll have to save your pocket money until there's enough in the kitty to buy a new one for your precious Mrs. Phelps, won't you? With that, he dropped the now empty covers of the book into the basket and marched out of the room, leaving the tally blaring. Most children in Matilda's place would have burst into flooded tears. She didn't do this. She sat there very still and white and thoughtful. She seemed to know that neither crying nor sulking ever got anyone anywhere. The only sensible thing to do when you are, when you are attacked is, as Napoleon once said, counterattack. Matilda's wonderfully subtle mind was already at work devising yet another suitable punish for the poisonous parent. The plan that was now beginning to hatch in her mind deepened, or depended, however, upon whether or not Fred's parrot was really as good a talker as Fred made out. Fred, who was a, who was a friend of Matilda's, 
He was a small boy of six who just lived around the corner from her, and for days he had been going on about this great talking parrot his father had given him. So the following afternoon, as soon as Mrs. Wormwood had departed in her car for another session of bingo, Matilda set out for Fred's house to investigate. She knocked on his door and asked if he would be kind enough to show her famous bird. Fred was delighted and led her up to his bedroom where a truly magnificent blue and yellow parrot sat on a tall cage. There it is, Fred said. His name is Chopper. Make a talk, Matilda said. You can't make a talk, Fred said. You have to be patient. I'll tell you when it feels like it. They hung around waiting. Suddenly the parrot said, hello, hello, hello. It was exactly like a human voice. Matilda said, that's amazing. What else can it say? Rattle my bones, the parrot said, giving a wonderful in in Im imitation of a spooky voice. Rattle my bones. He's always saying that, Fred said to her. What else can you say, Matilda said. That's about it, but it's pretty marvelous, don't you think? It's fabulous, Matilda said. Will you lend them to me for just one night? No, Fred said, certainly not. I'll give you all my next week's pocket money, Matilda said. That was different. Fred thought about it for a few seconds. All right then, he said, if you promise to return him tomorrow. Matilda staggered back to her own empty house carrying the tall cage in both hands. There was a large fireplace in the dining room and she now set about wedging the cage up the chimney and out of sight. That wasn't so easy, but she managed it in the end. Hello, 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 the bird called down to her. Hello, hello, shut up you nut, Matilda said and she went out to wash the soot off her hands. That evening, while the mother and father and brother Matilda were having supper, supper, as usual in the living room in front of the television, a voice came across loud and clear. Hello, hello, hello. Harry, cried the mother, turning white. There's someone in the house. I, I heard a voice. So did I, the brother said. Matilda jumped up and switched off the telly. Shh, she said. They all stopped eating and sat there very tense, listening. Hello, 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 cried the voice again. There it is, cried the brother. It's burglars, hissed the mother. They're in the dining room. I think there they are, the father said, sitting tight. Then go and catch them, Harry, hissed the mother. Go out and collar them red-handed. The father didn't move. He seemed in no hurry to dash off and be a hero. His face had turned gray. Get on with it, hissed the mother. They're probably after the silver. The husband wiped his lips nervously with his napkin. Why don't we all go and look together? Come on then, the brother said. Come on, mum. They're definitely in the dining room, Matilda whispered. I'm sure they are. The mother grabbed a poker from the fireplace. The father took a golf club that was standing in the corner. The brother seized the table lamp, ripping the plug out of its socket. Matilda took the knife and she, that she had been eating with. All four of them crept towards the dining room floor door, and the father kept <clears throat> the father keeping well behind the others. Hello, 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 came the voice again. Come on, Matilda cried, and she burst into the room, brandishing her knife. Stick him up, she yelled. We've caught you. The others followed her, waving their weapons. Then they stopped. They stared around the room. There was no one there. There's no one here, the father said, greatly relieved. I hear him, Harry, the mother shrieked, still quaking. I distinctly heard his voice. So did you. I'm certain I heard him, Matilda cried. He's in here somewhere, she began searching behind the sofa, behind the curtains. Then came the voice once again, soft and spooky this time. Rattle my bones, it said. Rattle my bones. They all jumped, including Matilda, who was a pretty good actress. They stared around the room. There was still no one there. It's a ghost, Matilda said. Heaven help us, cried the mother, clutching her husband around the neck. I know it's a ghost, Matilda said. I've heard it here before. The room is haunted. I thought you knew that. Save us, the mother screamed, almost throttling her husband. I'm getting out of here, the father said, grayer than ever now. They all fled, slamming the door behind them. The next afternoon, Matilda managed to get a rather sooty and grumpy parrot down from the chimney and out of the house without being seen. She carried it through the back door and ran with it all the way to Fred's house. Did it behave itself, Fred asked her. 
We had a lovely time with it, Matilda said. My parents adored it. Well, that's the end of chapter four, boys and girls. And again, hug your pet, kiss your pet day. This is Mr. Watson. He's having a great day, taking naps as usual. Okay, it's almost the end of the week. Thank you so much, boys and girls, for doing your very best on all of your work. I miss you, and I look forward to the day where we'll all be together again, okay? Bye, everyone.